Good morning. What a real joy it is to be with you again this morning, not able to gather physically, but able to link our arms on this virtual platform as we share thoughts on some passages from God's Word as we lift our prayers to God. I would like to read as a call to worship some verses from Acts 26 and also from uh, Revelation. But God has helped me to this very day, so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I'm saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. And then a verse from Revelation. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we are adopted as your children, your sons and your daughters, and that we can gather in your name, asking that you would give us new insights into the passages that we'll be looking at this morning. And not only that we get new insights, but we pray as we always do, that our lives will reflect our understanding of your word in a way that brings you glory. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. What is the gospel message? Do you know and live the gospel message? The gospel message is the foundation of our faith, the foundation upon which it is built. It is the road upon which we travel as we travel on our journey of faith. And it is the bridge that allows us to cross and break the separation between us and God, to break the sentence of eternal death and separation from God. All of the Bible points to the gospel message, and yet growing up, I don't recall hearing a sermon that addressed this topic directly or as bluntly as asking the question, what is the gospel message? At Christmas, we celebrated the birth of Jesus, at Easter, his crucifixion and resurrection. Ascension Day was a public holiday, and we had services at the time of Pentecost, and we celebrated Trinity Sunday. There was teaching on particular books of the Bible, and of course, all of these contain collectively the gospel message. Selected passages such as Moses crossing the Red Sea, David's battle with Goliath, the fall of Jericho, prophecies of Isaiah, the many beautiful psalms, the miracles performed by Jesus, Jesus calming the storm, feeding the 5,000 on the road to Emmaus with the two disciples and many, many others. But I think it was at the time, which was now more than 20 years ago, when I was first called upon to deliver a sermon, that I began to consider what my answer would be if someone said to me, so you are a Christian. Tell me, what is the gospel message? And I realized that it wouldn't help to say to the questioner that the questioner should read the Bible or to point him or her in isolation to Daniel in the lion's den or John the Baptist preaching at the Jordan River. And so I grappled with this. Um, maybe your experience was different. But I asked the question, can you relate to this? And I imagine that many of you will say that your experience was similar to mine and that you might have been a little at a loss if someone unexpectedly asked you the question there and then to explain what is the gospel message. So this morning, I want to look at this question and to consider four points that help me understand and explain the gospel message, and I trust that they will help you as well. Number one is God is our holy creator and righteous judge. Two, we live in a fallen world where sin separates us from God. 
Three, God sent Jesus to die for us, to break that separation. And four, by responding and repenting, we are saved. The first point, which we will touch on only very briefly this morning, is that God is our holy creator and righteous judge. We as men and women were created in God's image, so created to serve, worship, and reflect Him. The chief end of men and women is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever, but this required men to act in obedience to God, and living in obedience to God meant that men and women were, while they did this, with God and were not separated from Him in any way. The second point is that we live in a fallen world where sin separates us from God. And this resulted from mankind rebelling against God by sinning against His holy character and law. Our participation in sin comes both from Adam as representative of mankind and from our own actions as well. And because of this, we are exposed to the righteous wrath of God and to judgment resulting in our eternal separation from God. We are all sinners. In the words of Isaiah, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. Just as a person who doesn't believe they are drowning will not believe that they need a lifeguard, so a person who doesn't believe that he or she is a sinner will see no need for a saviour. As a writer said, there must first be an explanation of the bad news that we are all sinners before explaining the good news. Paul, writing to those in Rome, wrote that there is no one righteous, no, not one, and also that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and that includes all of us. Every one of us has transgressed the laws of God in our thoughts, words and deeds more times than we could ever imagine. And our sin separates us from God, and this is a separation that we can't bridge through our own efforts, through our own thoughts or through our own actions. The Old Testament, of course, is full of examples of the failure of the people of God to keep God's laws, to keep God's commandments through their own strength and through their own efforts. And time and time again, we see how they fail. It is as if we are standing on one side of a very deep ravine with God on the other side, out of reach, out of reach by us. And it's because of this, and because God so loved the world, that he sent his one and only Son to save us. And this brings us to the third point in the Gospel message, and the one that we look at in the most detail, namely that God sent Jesus to die for us, to break our separation from God. And I want to consider this against the background of a passage from Isaiah 53 and from a few verses from Paul's writing to those in Corinth. The book of Isaiah was written more than 700 years before the birth of Christ, and I want to start with the prophecy in Isaiah 53. As I read these verses now, consider how these words, the shoot coming up from the stump of Jesse, Jesse the father of David, describe how Jesus would come to earth to live among us, to be rejected, to be pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities, all of this so that we, who like sheep have gone astray, would be healed, would be forgiven. We would be forgiven through Jesus taking on the punishment that we deserved. From Isaiah. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, 
a man of suffering, familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah foretelling in great detail the coming of Jesus, Jesus from the line of David, Jesus not being accepted for who he was, God the Son come to earth as man, and Jesus being despised, and pierced for our transgressions, so that we who had gone astray, each going our own way, could be healed and could be forgiven. God the Father laying on Jesus the iniquity of us all, offering a sacrifice, just as the priests would have laid their hands on the scapegoat and symbolically put Israel's sins on it, foretelling that Jesus would be crucified as the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. It's worthwhile reading Psalm 22, where this is also graphically foretold. And I move then to two passages in the letters by Paul written to the Corinthians, and I start with 1 Corinthians, where we read this. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures. Paul makes this statement, having reminded his brothers and sisters of the gospel that he had preached to them, of the gospel that they had received, of the gospel that led them to become believers, to become followers of Christ, and the gospel that had led them to be saved. And then he reminds his readers, as he reminds us, that in accordance with the scriptures, Christ died for our sins. In the words of Isaiah, Christ was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Then he was buried, but on the third day he rose again. And the next passage is just one sentence from uh, 2 Corinthians. Listen to this. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And the footnote in my Bible describes this verse as a summary of the gospel and its logic. And I want us to look at this very short verse as we move towards getting an answer to that question, what is the gospel message? We need to consider this verse against the background of the Old Testament and our first two points, namely that God is our creator, God and righteous judge. And secondly, that we live in a fallen world where we are all sinners under a sentence of eternal death and separation from God if we strive only in our own strength. God sent Jesus God the Son, as man, to die for us, to break the separation from God. God not only sent Jesus to live with us, but in his death on the cross, made him, that is Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us. An author wrote this, He, God, treated Jesus as if he had committed every sin every ever committed by every person who would ever believe, even though he, Jesus, had in fact committed none of them. Jesus was crucified. He hung on the cross holy and sinless, the spotless lamb. God treating Jesus as if he had lived my life. God treating Jesus as if he had lived your life. And then God who punished Jesus for my sin and your sin, turns around 
and treat me and treat you as if we had lived his. Our sin placed on the shoulders of Jesus and the righteousness of Jesus credited to us. And all of this by the grace of God, not because of anything that we had done. In fact, despite everything that we have done. And Paul wrote this to those at Ephesus. But God being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. What does this mean? It means that by grace, the cross of Jesus provides the bridge that we may use to cross the ravine that separates us from God. The cross of Jesus provides the bridge. Have you ever paused to really consider this? If you have, consider it again now. And if you've never considered this before, let us do so as we look at the fourth point in the gospel message. By responding and repenting, you are saved. It means that as you respond to the good news, the slate is wiped clean. Your sins are forgiven. You have complete forgiveness and you are covered by the righteousness of Jesus. Focus on what this means. It means that when God looks at the cross, he sees you and me. And when God looks at you and me, he sees Jesus. Let me just say that again. When God looks at the cross, he sees you and me. And when God looks at you and me, he sees Jesus. What we are called to do in order to be saved is the following. And it's important that we look at this. We're called to respond to the good news of the gospel message. We are to repent of our sins by turning away from them and by turning to God. Paul again to the Romans describes how we are saved. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. An author put it like this, Through repentance from our sin and faith in the death and resurrection of Christ, we are welcomed into the family of God as those declared righteous in the sight of God. As we grow in grace and truth, God transforms us into the image of Christ and we begin to bear the fruit of righteousness and await future glorification. As we respond to the gospel message by repenting and accepting Jesus as our Lord and Saviour, we are forgiven and the separation from God is broken. What does this mean for you and for me? I believe it means that you and I need to meditate and to pray about these four points. Pray for a deeper understanding of what these four points mean, but pray particularly that you will be given insights and the strength to live your life responding to the gospel message with thanksgiving. Responding in a way that ensures that your life reflects the teachings of Jesus and brings glory to God. Do this with thanksgiving by living fully for what has been done for you. St. Irenaeus of Lyons knew this and put it like this, the glory of God is man and woman fully alive. Fully alive in the sense of having Christ in you, but fully alive in living our lives here and now in a way that reflects that we are disciples of Christ and brings glory to God. Create in your mind uh, a vision of what life will be like where we as believers live this 
believe this and reflect this. What can we do as a congregation and as a community as we live in that way? Not looking back to past transgressions, but as sons and daughters of God, fully forgiven with the assurance of eternal life with God. Peter wrote this, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do so with gentleness and with respect. Be ready for the question, what is the gospel message? And use these points to guide your answer. God is our holy creator and righteous judge. We live in a fallen world where sin separates us from God. God sent Jesus to die for us to break that separation. And by responding and repenting, we are saved. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you as your sons and your daughters. Help us to truly understand the gospel message. Help us truly to respond to the gospel message, where we have done so to make sure that our life reflects that in everything we do. Where we have not done so, now to accept Jesus as Lord and Saviour, to pray for the forgiveness of those things that we've done in the past that we ought not to have done and those things that we have left undone that we ought to have done. So that as we confess this, we are forgiven. We pray this, Lord, in your wonderful and precious and holy name. Amen. There are two lovely songs that I would like you to listen to. Both of them, in a way, encapsulate the whole gospel message. The first one was written as a song for Christmas, but one can listen to this at any time of the year. Joy Has Dawned, this by Keith and uh, Kristen Getty, written by them together with Stuart Townend. And the other is Salvation's Song. Think of the gospel message as you listen to these two songs. And uh, my prayer for you is that your life as you go ahead in this week will reflect the gospel message. As a benediction, I want to read these verses from Ephesians 2. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that the coming ages he might show the incompar incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Amen. The dawn of time, chosen by my Maker, hidden in my Savior, I am His, and He is mine, cherished for eternity.